Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can vocal features be used to predict depression? So can somebody's voice be used to tell if that person has depression? So this is an interesting question, and I actually kind of came about this question because of a comment that was made on another video where somebody noted in a polite way that my voice was depressing them, which I found pretty interesting. I think you could look at someone's voice on YouTube, like my voice, and say maybe it's irritating, boring, soporific, relaxing, a lot of different traits, but depressing? I thought that was an interesting twist. Again, the individual is polite. They still like the videos. They just thought my voice was depressing. So I looked into this, right? This wasn't really a question they were asking, just a statement. But I looked into it, and I couldn't find any evidence that somebody's voice can actually be depressing. But I found other articles about how vocal qualities are used to predict depression. And it's an area I really hadn't looked in too much before this. So it was actually pretty fascinating, and the results were quite surprising. So if the other question was asked, can my voice cause somebody to be depressed, I don't really know. I mean, maybe, but I don't see any evidence in the research literature to support that. I guess it's more anecdotal. So is it possible? Sure. And if my voice is depressing somebody, that is an unfortunate consequence, and I wouldn't want that to happen, but I don't know what to really do there. But if the question were, can vocal features predict depression? Well, that's what I'm going to answer here in this video. So when we hear this question, we think of machine learning, algorithms, and sophisticated technology. But actually, the question goes back many years before a lot of these things were readily available or widely used. I found one article that dated back to 1964 that discussed the topic. But for today's video, I'll be using articles from 2016 and 2019, and I'll put the references for those articles in the description for this video. So as I start to take a look at this question, first I'll talk about depression. What is depression? So depression is a set of symptoms, and we usually think about these symptoms in the context of a mental disorder like major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder, but it can also be in other disorders like bipolar disorder. The symptoms include low mood, loss of interest in activities that normally bring pleasure, difficulty sleeping, fatigue, appetite changes, feeling worthless, having trouble concentrating, and a few other potential symptoms. Typically, depression is considered episodic, so it tends to come and go in episodes and not be constant, although it can be constant. About 17% of people will have a major depressive episode at some point in their lives. And depending on the study that you look at, it's considered either the number two or the number one cause of disability in the world. And in terms of financial costs, globally, the costs are approaching $1 trillion. So depression is certainly a disorder that is problematic. It causes a great deal of suffering, and we need to address it. But is assessment really a problem? Do we have difficulty in assessing depression accurately? Do we need to keep studying new ways to determine if somebody has depression? Well, even though depressive symptoms seem fairly clear, assessment methods are actually not as accurate as we would like. So, for example, even with structured interviews to determine if somebody has one or more mental disorders, these are interviews that last usually an hour and a half. The inter-rater reliability is fairly low. So what this means is that you could have the same person going to two different clinicians, and again, spending about an hour and a half with each of those mental health counselors, and they would often end up with a different diagnostic impression. So the two counselors wouldn't necessarily agree on what's going on diagnostically. So why are we so bad at assessing depression? Well, there's a few different reasons. I think lack of experience and poor training of clinicians are two key parts. But also, most of the information considered for a diagnosis comes from the client, and depression can change the way somebody reports symptoms. So the mental disorder itself can interfere with diagnosing. Also, mental health clinicians use other sources of information, like, if the client permits it, friends and family members, so they can report information about the client. Well, that information could be incorrect or biased, 
right? The family members or the friends may have ulterior motives, or they might not understand depression, so they exaggerate or report things that aren't necessarily true. So we have really potentially poor information, and again, the training side has to be addressed in terms of assessing depression. So that covers depression, but what about the vocal features? Well, one area that's emphasized when we talk about voice or vocal features would be vocal prosody. So vocal prosody is a composite of supra-segmental acoustic features of speech, right? So beyond the lexical, syntactic, and semantic content of the signal, right, of the speech. So the primary features of vocal prosody would include fundamental frequency, which is perceived as pitch, intensity, which is perceived as loudness, and timing, which is perceived as speech rate, rhythm, and patterning in normal conversation. Now we see a number of other features in vocal prosody as well, like jitter and shimmer, the cycle-to-cycle -cycle variation in frequency and intensity, but the emphasis in terms of researching emotions and the relationship to voice is really just on two factors, frequency and timing. So looking at the general results of these studies we see on voice and depression, can someone's voice be used to determine if they have depression? Well, generally, yes. Vocal features can predict depression and the severity of depression fairly well, actually surprisingly well. The prediction can usually be made with less than 10 seconds of actual voice data. So really, I think in terms of our understanding of depression, these are kind of surprising findings. You wouldn't expect voice to be that good in terms of predicting depression, but it is. Voice actually tells us a lot about depressive symptoms. But what about the actual vocal qualities? What voice features actually predict depression or predict depression severity? Well, the first area here is around interpersonal timing. And the term used is switching pause. So a switching pause is the time between one speaker's churn and that of another speaker. As depression becomes less severe, switching pauses become shorter, so the actual length of time, the length of the pause, decreases, and the length of the pause has less variability, becomes less variable. So instead of having times, the durations of the pauses spread out over a wide distribution, they're narrowed, so it's easier to predict the length of the pause. Now these switching pauses I'm talking about are the pauses made by the person who's depressed, right, the participant in a research study. But in order to have these conversations, there's also an interviewer. So somebody's talking to that participant, and their vocal features are tracked in these studies as well. And what's really interesting here is that the interviewer switching pauses also become shorter and less variable as depression becomes less severe. So it seems like the interviewers are reacting to changes in the participants. So interpersonal timing is actually strongly related to depression severity. So it's not just a decent predictor, it's an exceptional predictor. It accounts for one-third of the variation in depression severity. So again, that's incredibly robust when we talk about human behavior and trying to predict mental disorders and symptoms. What's more is that timing can be measured easily with relatively low-cost instrumentation. So it could be used for assessment of people with depression and also for monitoring depressive symptoms over time. So that covers timing, but what about fundamental frequency? Again, what we perceive as pitch. Well, participant frequency had no effect. The fluctuation in depression severity was independent of changes in frequency. It may be useful for determining personality traits, but not for determining depression severity. Here's what's interesting, though. Again, it has to do with the interviewer. Interviewer frequency was associated with depression severity. It actually had a large effect size. As depression became less severe, interviewer frequency increased and was less variable. So put another way, as depression became more severe, the interviewer decreased their frequency and became more expressive. So again, it seems like the interviewer is really picking up on something that's going on in that conversation. So with all this in mind, if we take participant and interviewer vocal timing and frequency together, we take it all together, 
it accounts for 60% of the variance in depression scores. So it could be highly useful in determining the severity of depression. Furthermore, using both participant and interviewer vocal prosody led to the correct classification of 69% of the cases. Using just the participant vocal prosody reduced the detection rates. So the interviewer component, right, their vocal features are actually pretty important to the predictive ability. So when using this method with vocal features, we need to factor in both the participant and the interviewer at the same time. So all these discoveries around vocal features and depression are really valuable for a few different reasons, but one that stands out is that the actual words of the client or the participant are not factored in. With this particular assessment technique, this is really done by a machine. The vocal features that the machine is measuring exist regardless of what somebody's actually saying. So again, it's not dependent on the content. It's really just dependent on the vocal prosody. Now looking at a potential downside of this technology, could these depression detecting robots or devices be available to anybody? And what would that mean? Could employers use this technology to figure out who's depressed in their workforce and fire them? Could your smartphone monitor a conversation you're having and tell you when that conversation is over that you might be depressed? My smartphone is already too nosy right now. It knows where I am. It knows what I'm thinking about leaving for work. I can't imagine it giving me mental health advice on top of that. So I finish a conversation. I look down and it says, hey, Dr. Grande, your mood seems a little off. Maybe you should consider talking to somebody, right? I don't need that from my phone. So does this mean that it's time to do away with mental health clinicians in favor of robots? For a long time, I predicted this day is coming, right? Most jobs eventually will be replaced by robots, sadly. Well, in the case of mental health counselors, at least with depression assessment, maybe not quite yet. It's worth noting here, again, when looking at the results of these studies, that the mental health clinicians who are interviewing the people who are depressed were having these changes in their vocal features. So they're probably already detecting the depression, or at least they know something is going on with the participant or the client. So again, some of this might be about training in the assessment of depression. We just need better training of clinicians. And even though the machines to detect frequency and timing aren't really that expensive, it's hard to imagine that they're going to be deployed on a wide scale. So it really does come down to clinician skill, which is true so much of the time. So we see some interesting findings here with vocal features and depression, but again, we have to keep in mind the clinician is still very important to the process. Maybe in the future the robots can take over, but for right now it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. I know whenever I talk about topics like depression and vocal features, there are going to be a variety of opinions. People who agree with me, disagree with me, and who have other thoughts from their experiences with depression. Please put these opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of vocal features and depression to be interesting. Thanks for watching.